This address is for Christians. And in speaking to Christians, I speak to those whose sex identity is certain. Over the next 20 minutes, I will show you that your gender, or better, your sex identity is physically certain, and is theologically certain, is historically certain. You Christian young men and women have a threefold confidence in the fact of your identity, your biological sex, your baptism, your birthday. In speaking to you about the certainty of your sex identity, my objective this afternoon will be to strengthen your confidence to confess before a world of gender chaos and ambiguity that your sex is given, not chosen. That it is fixed, not broken. It leaves you at rest, not wandering or wondering. That it is not lost, but it is found in time, in nature, in reality, ultimately in Christ. And here's our starting point. What the Bible says is a human being. The biblical formula for creating a human being is spirit plus matter equals a living soul. A human being is a living soul made of an interpenetrating unity of a divinely created spirit and a physical body. So who and what you are is necessarily and essentially bound to your body. God created us as living souls. He did so in complementary categories that were not just good, but very good. Male and female, he created us. Who you are in spirit is at one with your sex. You are a male or you are a female. And this is good. And the complementarity of it is good too. And so much so that it's woven into the fabric of nature. Our book of Concord therefore states that the natural state of one sex for the other sex is an ordinance of God in nature. The biblical definition of a human being also is why death itself must be defeated. Death means separation. In death, spirit is separated from body, jeopardizing the soul's integrity. In other words, death dehumanizes humanity by tearing the spirit from the body. Resurrection, however, rehumanizes the soul by galvanizing spirit and body together forever. Your identity in the resurrected Christ becomes a physical reality forever. We confess this in the creeds when we say, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Whose resurrected body? Yours. Everlasting life is embodied life. The body that you have right now, that is you, will be transformed. So there is no question that your body, your sex identity matters and matters now. now. This sensible biblical teaching has been rejected by competing anthropologies that start with humanity, not God that believe that the human will is the ultimate power in the universe, not nature and certainly not the creator. And so what was natural and normative and self-evident, namely that our sex identity is given to us as male and female, that they are complementary, is under the strongest challenge. And the opposing side has overwhelmed common sense to the point that even earlier this week, the British Medical Association advised its 156,000 doctor members of this, that they should no longer call pregnant women expected mothers because that may offend transgender persons, but rather they should refer to pregnant people. And this policy change is being enforced, you have to understand, on a country of 65 million citizens as normative even though the total number of transgender pregnant persons in the UK is one. How did this cultural transformation take place so quickly? Well, in our brief time, I can only trace for you here the, the method of change. After rejecting both a creator and the governance of the natural order, supporters of this cultural shift first aim to, you have to understand these terms, complexify to make complex 
the idea of gender to undermine existing facts about male and female, and then to simplify the conversation in order to normalize their values. It starts with redefining a human being. It goes from a simple unity of body and spirit to now complicated, overlapping spectrums of identity makers. And the gender-bred person shows how the binary sexes of male and female are now polarized, representing the extreme ends of an ever-broadening line, made more complicated by layers of identity components. You see here, there's gender identity, how you and your mind think about yourself. It's, as here says, it's chemistry that composes you and how you interpret what that means. There's also the gender expression, the demonstration of your preferred gender through the ways you act, dress, and behave. There's a spectrum regarding biological sex. This refers to your organs, hormones, and chromosomes. And lastly, there's the complicating factor of sexual orientation. That's who you are attracted to. The complexification and redefinition of human being complicates the storyline about sex and identity so that now, according to this Venn diagram, a majority of people move out of natural male and female distinctions into several other competing categories and subcategories of gender identification. The result of this complexification is the multiplication of gender identities, 37 at present and counting. And put differently, straight, male and female has been pushed to the periphery as minority op opinion and redefined as cisgender, meaning a person who happens to have a gender identity that matches the sex that they were assigned at birth. Male and female are no more. So that there is the new you, if you so choose. Did you notice how the redefinition of identity move from the objective, nature, God, biology, to now the subjective, personal choice? Did you see how it went from being recognized according to nature and declared by God, by parents, even the law, to now self-interpretation? The, mo the movement is from the real, the real world into your world through personal choice. The individual becomes a law unto themselves, and that is now becoming public policy. The complex becomes simple through explanation, and that's what this slide represents here, the books and articles. But the explanation is not by way of reason or logic. Instead, the insistence on total cultural acceptance and conformity is explained in terms of feelings and personal sentiments. When personal identity is purely subjective, merely a personal choice, then the only way to justify that which is contrary to nature and normalcy is to talk about your inscrutable feelings because there is no arguing or debating someone's feelings. I feel like a woman. And so instead of Descartes, I think, therefore I am, it's now ignorant Cartesianism. I feel, therefore I am. Conversation ceases, there is no debate, no instruction, not even between parents and child, because the child now has the right to self-discovery, independent of the superimposition of a gender role by mother and father, and there's nothing left but autobiography. Call me Caitlin. Why? Because I feel like Caitlin. The next step in simplification in a post-rational society is to normalize it through saturation. It's everywhere, and everyone's talking about it, or rather expressing their feelings about it. And it feels good. And if it feels good, it must be good, because what is human is normal, and what is normal is good. In a context dominated by tolerance, ethics, and political correctness, Objections are futile because there is no argument. It's all now a matter of feelings, emotions, and self-interpretation. 
And in a narcissistic age driven by the cult of celebrity, this is something to be celebrated. Saturation is followed by celebration of the new heroes. In this slide, we see a fresh assault on womanhood as biological women are no longer sufficiently feminine in an age of self-interpretation. Transgendered men are now more the archetypal woman than a woman. The female entertainer of the year, female model of the year are natural born men. Indeed, the woman of the year is a man otherwise known as Bruce. These are the celebrated heroes of modernity that applauds a new sexism. And for something to be normalized, it needs to be embraced at the earliest ages. And here we see six-year-old character in the Fox TV show, The Mick, exploring the gender spectrum until presumably he self-interprets his penis to be a vagina or an eggplant or a cell phone. After all, it is his choice. But what about intersex persons? Those born with arguably both sex organs and or an admixture of male-female uh, chromosomes. Well, I have to tell you that such people are the fantastic exception that account for a mere 0.017 births. And so here, I address not that tiny fraction of birth defects, but those biologically male and female who are told today that they have a choice to reject their sex and to choose another. Christian men, I speak especially to you because men are 3.3 times more likely to transgender than women. I said that there were three ways that your sex identity as a Christian is certain, physically or naturally, theologically, and historically. To explain the, the physical certainty of your identity, I use India as a backdrop. Neither homosexuality nor transgendering was known in India until very recently and only because of the encroachment of Western values. Why? Why is it that even still there's virtually no gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria among Indians? Well, the answer is their worldview. Nature is greater than humanity. Nature determines who and what you are. Born a male or a female, the human will acquiesces to its place in the natural and cosmic order. India's laws even reflect this. Note Statute 377 entitled, Unnatural Offenses. Whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man or woman shall be imprisoned. The significant here is that rightly ordered Human behavior is grounded in nature. Men are complementary to women and vice versa. There is an expectation in India to embrace identity given in nature, for this is in keeping with the order of nature itself. But when we come to Western ideas, things go upside down. Nature is not a force greater than the human will. Instead, it's a commodity to be consumed. Human choice and specifically human choosing is the ultimate power that we are told everyone possesses. We have no king in this country. Instead, we are the sovereign voters. We choose who shall govern. We choose what the law shall be. We expect and demand choices for everything. Greatly factoring into this way of thinking is consumerism. The consumer, the customer, is sovereign. With our will, our choice as the highest inscrutable good, with being told from our earliest years that you can be whatever you want to be, it was inevitable that even one's gender or sex would become a matter of choice, a choice over against nature and, by extension, over against God. The movement was from making our own laws and choosing our own governors to, to being our own law and governor. And when everyone possesses that ultimate power, constitutional freedoms give way to individual freedoms so that the tail winds up wagging the dog. Individuals dictate how the whole will think and behave. 
And those who were the exception become the law, and what was once the law becomes the exception. Choosing gender identity is now the ultimate act of self-creators, and therefore the ultimate rejection of the creator tantamount to the deification of humanity. For you Christians, though, there is a fact greater and a higher authority than human decisions. And that authority is the Lord our God, the Creator Redeemer. His will, His word trumps humanity's word and will. And this point concerning the objectivity of God's word by itself puts to rest any question concerning your own sexual identity. He created you male and female. The way that Luther explained it was through the theological concept called nominalism. Luther's nominalism argued that God, the highest definitive authority in the universe, speaks or names a thing into existence, then that thing is what it is by the authority and authorship of God. There is no higher authority to contradict the creator king or designate anything otherwise. So when God, at your birth, declares you male or female, then that word actuates a reality that is definitive. You are thereby created naturally, biologically, male or female. It is that certain. He who knew you before you were born gifted your biological identity, and by his wisdom, manifest through his word, he accomplished it. He spoke, and it was done. And this reality is intensified by the fact of performative speech acts. These are words invested with power that come from the authoritative source that do what they say. What we're talking about is verbal action does something in addition to indicating something. And holy baptism is the most perfect example of this, of a divine performative speech act. There God speaks your name, addressing his sex-determined creation and declares it to be plunged into the name and therefore the life of the triune God. He speaks your name, takes your created male or female body, identified the same biological person that he spoke into natural biological existence through his nominal power, and engages in another act of creation. In fact, recreation through baptism. His baptizing word, again, accomplishing what it says. Friends, it is that certain. You were created male or female. You were baptized male or female, and you therefore will be resurrected male or female. So says God, and his word establishes the state of affairs. It is the abiding, unalterable reality because there is no higher authority or power to contradict it. His word about your identity is certain. So you can rest. You can rest in that and not be deceived by consumerism. Holy baptism is therefore juridical, an availing and definitive declaration by God, and ontological. It alters your sex-specific being by uniting Christ to you as he has made you and determined you to be. Your relationship to God is as he determined. And so your identity is objective. It is not an idea or a feeling that you move on. It is gifted to you. It is declared to you. It addresses you as you really are, without deception or mutilation or cosmetic alteration or manufactured drugs. As Christians, we conform to God's definitive reality. We do not project a self-determined artificiality. Your sexual identity is physically objective. And aside from the fact of your sex identity determined in utero, as well as at birth, there's the reality that despite what drugs and surgeries may do, their effect can only be cosmetic. It can only be outward. Your essential DNA, your chromosomes will ensure that you will live and die according to your original gift of your biological sex. Put differently, you can disfigure the, the outward accidents, and make pretend about your gender, but you will never get to the substance of your spirit, body, and identity. 
which is by two divine acts of creation, male or female. Your sexual identity is theologically objective because God has spoken it into existence and reaffirmed it at your baptism with the definitive performative speech act. So seeing a baptismal font is like revisiting the delivery room where you were birthed. Your sexual identity is historically objective because in real human history, there are records of your birth, your baptism, and your family that identify you according to the reality of nature and the determination of God's word. Your sex identity is physically, theologically, and historically certain. In our last slide, how do we confess in this context? Let's face it, cultural changes are happening so fast and with greater frequency than ever before. And these new norms are being asserted without reflection, cogency, maturity, or honesty. The normalization of homosexual lifestyles, that took two decades. Marriage was redefined in less than one. And the evisceration of biological sexual categories of male and female has collapsed in the space of two years. What was essentially an essential difference, even a historical and biological difference, has now become tangential to choice but not so for us Christians. Our sex identity is certain. Young Christian men, let me speak first to the women. Young Christian women, your sex is being exploited as a commodity to be consumed, but now, perhaps worse, it is being undermined and undervalued and therefore disrespected by conferring a greater legitimacy of womanhood and femininity upon men. Speak into the murkiness of this moment with the clarity of your gifted objective identity. Young Christian men, you are especially targeted. Assert, therefore, the masculinity you learned from your fathers. Assert the masculinity you learned from your mentors, from Jesus Christ, our King, and from the holy saints of the church. Defend Christian women. Defend your masculinity and confess that Christ our King's word to you and word about you is definitive. Thank you.